Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm your host, Rick Bennett. Please consider donating or purchasing a transcript by going to our website, gospeltangents.com shop. You'll help support other documentaries and podcasts such as this. Mark Hoffman's forgeries and bombings have had a lasting impact on church history. In the 1970s, Leonard Arrington was a trained historian and became church historian. He opened the archives to many researchers and people interested in Mormon history. However, general authorities were concerned about some of the controversial aspects that were being uncovered. Of course, Mark Hoffman had a lot to do with some of those controversial documents. How big of an impact did he play in shutting down access to church records in the Church History Library? Kurt Bench will tell us about the, Mark Hoffman's impact. Check out our conversation. You know, I guess under the Leonard Arrington era of church history, Leonard Arrington was the church historian in the 70s and was very much more open to, uh, you know, real scholarship. He was he was actually had a degree in history. I know Rick Turley has a degree in history and law as well. Um, but uh, it, it seems like there was some openness in the 70s and in the 80s all of a sudden it got closed. You had the, uh, in 1993 I think we had the September 6th where President Packer spoke out against uh, intellectualism and, and feminism and uh, third thing that's gave it well, was it uh, might have been homosexuality yeah I think it was and then um, so you know I, my question is you know we had this openness and then in the 80s it closed do you think uh, a lot of the reason that that the closed off history was due to Mark Hoffman and some of these controversial documents you know and I know that recently I mean I have a book on Joseph Sear stones published by Deseret book um, which, you know, talks about the more magical nature of Joseph's translation, um, you know. And I do remember, uh, I believe it was at the Mormon History Association a few years ago, Ron Esplin, who's a church historian. Uh, this has probably been about five or six years ago, and at the time I remember when he said it, I was a little skeptical, but he said this is the most open time in church history. He says a lot of times we refer to the 1970s as the Camelot era, uh, he says now is a Camelot era, era as well, and with the Joseph Smith papers and Joseph Sear stones and some other things, I have to agree with Ron Espen. I think this is really a, an unprecedented openness. Now critics may say, well, that's because of the internet, uh, but I also wonder how much how much did Mark Hoffman play in closing down the history uh, that we've now opened up again, and even as we look at the Sear stone. You know, we talk about the salamander letter and that the magic nature's there. We kind of have opened up uh, more history, and, and we're more open to, yeah, Joseph didn't really use the Yerman he used the seer stone and that sort of a thing. So what do you think are Mark's impacts on church history in general, especially in the 1980s? He was asked during the interviews if he was trying to change church history. And at first he said no, and then he backtracked and said, well, I guess I was. And he did have an impact. He certainly made the church change its entire uh, approach to security, uh, of, you know, in protecting its holdings, and, uh, you know, it severely restricted access, I think. And, you know, there was a long period of time when they, I mean, they were trying to determine what they had in their own holdings that were genuine and weren't genuine. And uh, yeah, I th he definitely had an impact on how things were done at the Church History Library. Um, and uh, I know that it was a lot harder for me to do business with the church after that in terms of, I mean, before things were more, I don't know what the right word is, but it was easier to do business, it was, it was more informal and it became very formal. There were processes you had to go through and committees had to make decisions on acquisitions and things like that rather than just being left to an individual. Like President Hingley? Yeah, and, and then those who were under him that, that normally acquired things for the church. So yeah, it did make them re-examine everything and I think it, I think it did have that effect of kind of closing things up out of fear and out of, sus you know, suspicion of what could happen, um, but there has been, a, like you said, a remarkable, I don't know, I guess you'd almost call it a renaissance in a way, 
uh, and, and much more openness. <clears throat> a lot of that is due to uh, older Marlon Jensen, who was church historian uh, in a 70 for uh, a long time. Uh, he's emeritus now. And uh, assistant church historian Richard Turley has had an enormous effect that way in terms of openness and, and real scholarship and you know opening the books, literally and figuratively. Uh, and uh, Stephen Snow, who's the church historian now, and and most of the people, at least that I know, in the church historical department are very committed to openness and to true scholarship and to um, uh, this process of of knowing our history and and making it available to everyone. I I think it's quite remarkable compared to certain periods of our history. So I, I'm I'm encouraged by it. I I really think that uh, we are in a way in a new era, and I can only hope that it will get even better. But the Joseph Smith Papers Project is one um, one of the biggest evidences of that whole new attitude and openness. I mean, those scholars are not given a list of restrictions as to what they can research and what they can write about and publish. Um, I mean, it's talk about throwing the books open. I mean, they're they're doing it. They're making our history available and accessible. And, and there's some very impressive scholarship that's gone into that project, for example. And that that's had spin-offs. We see a lot of other research and writing and publishing that's being done as a result of that and that that whole attitude. Uh, Rick is no longer. Uh, assistant church historian, he's over public affairs now, but uh, I think he's one of the unsung heroes, in my opinion, uh, has helped us get to the point where we are now. And, and those others that I've mentioned, and, and many that we can't take the time to name. All right. Well, great. So uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up. Do you have any last uh, thoughts about anything we didn't cover as far as oh. uh, our coffee? <laughs> well, let's see. Do we have another hour? <laughs> uh, there's a lot we haven't covered, but uh, I think this will at least give people a flavor of, of what happened. Uh, it was a time that was hard to imagine, even at, while it was happening. It was just, there was a quality of surrealness and uh, uh, otherworldliness almost. I mean, like, can this really be happening in our beautiful city and in our church? And, um, you know, we weren't prepared for that, those kinds of events. They were just, they were traumatic. They were um, very harmful to many people. I mean, the, the people who were killed by Mark and their families, were the biggest victims, but there were so many victims uh, that were affected in so many ways. Uh, it's, I guess we just have to look to history to see how much uh, harm a single individual can do, or how much good a single individual can do. But Mark chose a dark path, and, uh, and it affected lots of lives. Um, but I, you know, I worried that after that, and, and uh, I also had another thing happen, uh, another person close to me that, uh, that uh, betrayed my trust in a, in a very dramatic way, and I wondered, you know, would I ever trust anybody again? I even kidded people, uh, I was gonna have my family investigated by the FBI to make sure that, you know, they were but I worried that I wouldn't trust people in the future uh, because my trust had been violated so so dramatically. And uh, and but it turned out that I just figured I can't live my life that way, and I can't be suspicious of everyone. Uh, that it, that I will still trust people unless they give me a reason not to. And I found that it's a much better way to live my life and it brings me a lot more peace than if I'm paranoid and suspicious and and think the worst of people. So I, I try to think the best of them unless, unless they give me a reason not to. But um, I think we've all learned a lot of lessons 
from uh, from these events, and uh, I think we're better for having gone through the fire. Um, I don't mean that it was a good thing for it to happen, but I think you have to choose how you're going to react to bad things that happen in your life, and uh, I think most people were able to make those choices and, and go on with their lives and, and hopefully live better lives as a result. Well, great. Well, Kurt Bench, we really want to thank you for letting me take uh, take your time here and benchmark books, and I'll, I'll encourage everybody to come Please. into the bookstore. <laughs> so, Please. Thanks again for, for participating with Gospel Tangents. Thank you. I'd like to thank Kurt Bench for spending so much time in talking with us. We really appreciate talking about the Hoffman bombings and his association with them. As we turn to our next guest, we're going to talk about another controversial topic, this time polygamy. I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Brian Hales. He's the foremost authority on polygamy, especially in Joseph Smith's day. In our next conversation, we'll talk about his recent court uh, deposition in, the, in Canada where he talked about a Canadian polygamy problem with Mormon fundamentalists. What they're able to do in Canada that we don't do in the U.S. is that they can petition their Supreme Court to rule on the constitutionality of a particular law. And so in 2012, they did this to the state, well, it would be the province of British Columbia, to the provincial court, saying, is this polygamy law constitutional? Click here to subscribe, click here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some other videos that we've done here on YouTube. We hope you'll use this as a valuable resource to learn more about Mormon history.